Hello and welcome to Ingleton Evangelical Church's YouTube service for Sunday the 10th of May. My name's Jim Day, I'm the pastor at Ingleton Evangelical Church and it's great to welcome you here. Whether you're uh, someone who's been tuning in all the way through since we've been in lockdown and watching on YouTube, or whether you're here for the first time and you're just listening in, I want to see what it is that uh, we believe uh, and that we proclaim, particularly, about God. Uh, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark on these Sundays, and the Gospel of Mark is all about who Jesus is and why he came. He's God the Son, and he came to save us. And what we're discovering as we go through Mark's Gospel is that Jesus is full of compassion and kindness towards people who desperately need salvation, who need saving. We'll see that this morning as we look at the end of Mark chapter 1 and the beginning of Mark chapter 2. We're going to jump straight into Mark's Gospel this morning as one of our younger people, Will, reads for us from the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. Mark chapter 1 verse 40 to Mark chapter 2 verse 12. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am the willing, he said. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him to him a paralysed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get, get to him because of the ground, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then he lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the t some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirits that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? which is easier to say to this paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praise God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Let's come before God in prayer now. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the immense privilege that it is as your people to be able to call you our Father in heaven. Thank you that we can approach your throne now to praise you, to worship you as the God who is King, the God who is Sovereign, the God who is in control of all things, including the situation we find ourselves in now. Thank you that we can come even though we are those who sin, even though we are those who do those things that actually you cannot look upon. We thank you that we can come because you sent us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we come in and through him. We have been forgiven in him. Uh, we have been united to him. Uh, we have in him one who has paid for our sin on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for humbling yourself 
for leaving the, the glory of heaven where you are the centre of all praise and all worship as God the Son. We thank you that you are now God the Son made man. Uh, we thank you that you lived on this earth, uh, that you know what it is to live in a world where there is suffering, there is pain, there is sadness, there is death. We thank you that you walked that path yourself. And we thank you for your kindness and your compassion. Your kindness and compassion to those suffering. Your kindness and compassion towards sinners. We thank you that you reach out in love towards those who are so in need of your healing touch. Lord, we pray for those who are ill at the moment. Particularly those who are suffering with this virus, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would heal. We pray for doctors and nurses in hospitals up and down the country that you would help them as they treat those who are ill. We pray for our government, uh, for our Prime Minister, for his cabinet, uh, for the civil service and other advisors. Lord, that you would give them great wisdom. We pray as uh, further guidance is given this evening that uh, you would uh, make sure that that is good and wise uh, instruction and that we would follow it and that Lord there would there would be a reduction in the, the transmission of this virus and the suffering caused by it. Uh, Lord we thank you that in your loving compassion you also reach out to forgive sinners and Lord we pray that you'd help us to see that as as great as this crisis is with the coronavirus it is not anything like as big as the crisis of sin so we pray that you would seek out and find sinners who will put their faith in you for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, we pray that through this situation, you would be uh, turning people's minds and hearts towards you, such that they seek you and find you, uh, such that they hear your voice and respond in repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord be with us now. Uh, help us as we think about your word the Bible. Help us to, to see Jesus, to see who he is and why he came into this world. And we ask this with the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus name. Amen. One of the horrors of COVID-19 is not only that it makes you very ill and in some cases kills you, but that it also cuts you off from people. Loved ones can't come near and touch you or hold you. This is a horrible thing, but it's not the first time that such a situation has arisen in history. This is not the first disease to bring about this kind of situation. In Jesus' time, there was a particular disease that cut you off from society altogether. And that disease was leprosy. It cut you off from your family, from your friends, from your community in which you lived. Leprosy was a bit of a catch-all term, if you like, for various skin conditions, some of them contagious, all of them making you very ill and slowly killing you. If you had it, you became an outcast. If you had it, you could no longer be a part of society in the way that a normal person would be you had to self-isolate. And that meant not just staying at home and occasionally answering the door when people knocked, it meant leaving your home, your town, the people you live, to live rough often out in the countryside. It was a horrible thing to have leprosy. People shunned you as well, of course. No one wanted a leper anywhere near them. So if you came close, they ran. So what the man at the start of our passage does today is actually shocking. This man is a leper and yet as a leper he approaches Jesus. You weren't supposed to do that if you had leprosy. You weren't supposed to approach anybody. You were supposed to self-isolate. And yet here he comes and he desperately collapses at Jesus' feet. These are his words spoken to Jesus in Mark chapter 1 verse 40. 
if you will, you can make me clean. Now, obviously, this man's isolation did not mean that he hadn't heard about the miraculous healings that Jesus had performed first in Capernaum and then in other towns in Galilee. Such as Jesus' fame spread that, that even this man has heard about what he can do. And he figured that if Jesus was healing people of other diseases, then surely he could heal his leprosy too. Now, most people would not have let a leper get anywhere near them, let alone close enough to kneel before them and beg them for something in this way. So Jesus perhaps had his back turned? Was he deep in conversation with someone and just hadn't noticed this leprosy-stricken man approach him? No, that's not it. And you can tell that that's not it uh, by the way that Jesus responds to the man now before him on his knees. Verse 41 reads like this. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Now let that sink in. Let it sink in because it's an astonishing thing for anyone to do. This leper could have been highly contagious with a deadly disease. Just as importantly for a Jew in actual fact, this leper was unclean in the eyes of the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law. And you didn't allow an unclean person anywhere near you. Yet Jesus, because of the pity and compassion he feels for this man, touches him. What we get here is an insight into the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. His natural inclination is to move compassionately towards the sick, the, sufferated, the suffering, the contaminated outcast. It's not as many would have done to recoil in horror, in disgust or in fear of perhaps contracting the disease himself. Having shown the compassion to reach out and touch the man, Jesus then says to him, I will be clean. Now, the very act of compassion in touching the man was astonishing, but the result of Jesus' words here is even more astonishing, arguably. Immediately the leprosy left the man and he was made clean. Not gradually over the next few days, his skin began to clear up to the point where actually it looked like normal skin again. No, immediately he was cured. If anyone else had touched this man, the leprosy would have remained and they too would have become unclean into the bargain. But not with Jesus. As he touches him, as he speaks to him, the leprosy disappears. It's gone and Jesus is not contaminated with leprosy or uncleanness himself. So what we have here is an astounding miracle and an astounding display of compassionate love. Having done this for the man, Jesus tells him he doesn't want him to go off and tell anybody else. What he does tell the man to do though is to, to go and show himself to the local priest, show that he no longer has leprosy. Uh, that was because under the Old Testament law, if you were cleansed or if you got well again after leprosy, you had to be declared clean by a priest in order to be readmitted back into normal society. Well, I'm sure the man did go eventually to the priest, but the thing we're told about that he does is that he goes off and tells loads of people what Jesus has done. And the result is that, that Jesus is mobbed again by huge crowds of people. They're desperate for them to be healed as well. We move on from there to, to Mark chapter 2. And the next thing that Mark wants to tell us about, it's connected with what happened with the leper. Uh, Jesus returns to the town where his ministry had started in chapter 1, Capernaum. And word gets around Capernaum that he's back. Not surprisingly, crowds begin to gather at the house where he was staying, probably Simon's house. 
Presumably they were there, gathering for, for similar reasons to previously. They wanted to receive healing of various ailments and diseases and sicknesses. But what Jesus wants to do is what we discovered he came to do back in chapter 1. He wants to preach the word to them, Mark chapter 2 verse 2. And that's what he does. He wants to make sure that they hear the good news, that they hear the gospel. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by what happens next. Four men from Capernaum had a friend. This friend of theirs couldn't walk. He's described as a paralytic in these verses. They, and presumably the paralytic man himself, had heard about Jesus and the way he could heal people of their diseases. So these four, men's, four men, out of love no doubt for their friend, pick him up and carry him to the house where Jesus is preaching. Once they get there, they discover it's absolutely packed out though. They can't get in. They're very resourceful though. Uh, they head up to the roof. Uh, now it's important to bear in mind that, that homes in areas like this 2000 years ago, they had external stairs up the outside of the house that led to a flat roof. Uh, that flat roof was constructed of wooden beams with uh, branches laid across them and then it all was packed down uh, with grass, mud and clay. It made for a pretty good roof, but it also made for a roof that you could dig through and make a hole in reasonably easily. And that's exactly what the four men did. They go up onto the roof, they begin to dig a hole in it. Once that hole is big enough, they lower their friend on his stretch-like bed through the hole down into the very room where Jesus is preaching. We might not have seen men being lowered through roofs yet uh, but we have seen plenty of people with various diseases being brought to Jesus in Mark's gospel or coming to Jesus themselves and he heals them. So as this man descends from the ceiling on his makeshift bed we're exacting, expecting exactly the same thing to happen here. We're expecting the next verse in this Mark's gospel in this account to read something like this. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, get up and walk. But that's not what he says. It's not what he says at all. He says something that, as we'll see, sounds completely outrageous. He says to the man in verse 5, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. Why does that sound outrageous? There are some Bible experts who were sat in the room when Jesus said this, and they can help us begin to understand why these words sound so outrageous. They were scribes, and they were in the room listening to Jesus preach. They had no doubt watched and listened intrigued as this man descended on a bed into the house wondering, well, what's Jesus going to do now? Who knows what they made of Jesus preaching up to this point? We're not told in these verses. We don't know whether they had a strong opinion on what Jesus had been saying. What we do know is that they had a very strong opinion on what Jesus says to the man when he eventually descends into the room. They have a strong opinion on him saying, son, your sins are forgiven. Here's what they were thinking in their hearts in verse 7 of Mark 2. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? These people are outraged by what Jesus says to the man. They're outraged because they think it's blasphemy. And blasphemy is an attack on God himself. They think that Jesus is attacking God, the God they say they believe in, by claiming that he can do what only God is entitled to do. Forgive. Now there are some pretty disturbing stories 
emerging about what people have been doing through the current crisis with the virus. I've heard a number of stories and read a number of stories of police, for example, being deliberately coughed over and then told, here, have coronavirus. Now, just imagine for a moment that your daughter was a policewoman and someone maliciously coughed over her in the way that I've just described. Imagine that your daughter then did develop coronavirus, that person who coughed over her had it. Imagine that she eventually lost her life to the disease. Now, imagine for a moment that I turn up at your home in the aftermath of all this. I listen to you tell me the whole story. And then I say, well, I want you to know that I have forgiven the person who coughed over your daughter, giving her that disease that has now killed her. I've forgiven her. I've forgiven him. How would you feel about me saying that? I presume you'd be pretty angry with me. What right have you to forgive them? You quite rightly asked me that. They didn't wrong you, you would be saying. They wronged my daughter and they wronged me by taking her from me. If anyone's in a position to forgive here, it's not you, it's me. That's my right. That's my entitlement. Well, it's that sort of reaction that the scribes are having here. As they hear Jesus say to a man he's only just met, Son, your sins are forgiven. And actually, it's a perfectly understandable reaction. Even a correct reaction if Jesus is just another human being like them. The scribes know that human beings shouldn't play at being God. It's worth it pointing out here that the Bible teaches us that when we do wrong, any wrong at all, we not only wrong specific other people who we have sinned against, we also wrong God at the same time. So, if I lose my temper with my children, it's not just them I need to say sorry to, I do need to say sorry to them, but I also need to seek God's forgiveness for losing my temper with them in that way. I need God's forgiveness because I've offended him in sinning in that way. The Bible teaches that every single sin, every single wrong word or thought or action is committed against God. Now the flip side of that is because every sin is committed against God, God has the right, God has the authority to forgive it. He has the authority to punish it as well, but he has the authority to forgive. Every sin is committed against God. He has the authority to commit every sin that every person commits. Now, no one else can do that. Definitely no human being. Now, the scribes know all this. And because they know all this, they are mad with Jesus. But Jesus knows what they're thinking. There's no indication that he's angry with them at this point for thinking that. But he does want to change their thinking. So he asks them a question in verse 9. He says this, Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk. 
That might seem like a, a strange way to try and change their thinking, but just take the question literally for a moment. Which is easier to say to someone who is paralysed? All your sins are forgiven, or rise, get up and walk. <coughs> it's much easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's no way of proving once that's been said that actually they haven't been. There's no visible thing to see. Whereas, of course, if you say to a paralysed man who everybody can see is paralysed and everybody in the room knows genuinely is paralysed because they live in the same town and they know the man, if you say to that man, get up and walk, well, you're going to see straight away whether those words carry any weight, any authority. Because if he doesn't immediately get up and walk, then your words mean nothing. But who can simply tell a paralytic to walk and it happens? Definitely no mere human. The greatest doctor in the world, the greatest physician in the world or physiotherapist in the world can't just tell someone who is paralysed to walk and it happens. No, only God can do that. That's why Jesus says what he says next in verses 10 and 11. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Now, Son of Man there is a way that Jesus refers to himself. So what Jesus is saying here in effect is this. Yes, only God has the authority to forgive sins with a word but also only God has the power to make a paralytic man walk with a word so I will show you who I am that I am God the Son by demonstrating a power that only God has the power to make a paralyzed man walk simply by telling him to you'll see straight away that I have that power, that I am no mere human then, but I am God the Son in human flesh. And if I am God the Son, then I do have the authority to forgive sin and I'm not committing blasphemy when I say, Son, your sins are forgiven. All a person's sin has been committed against me. Therefore, I can forgive it. Well, Jesus, in saying these words, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic man, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. In doing that, Jesus has set the scene here in such a way that, that everything will hang on what happens next. Will the man remain on his bed, unable to walk? If he does, then all of Jesus' claims to forgive sins tumble down. Or will he rise, pick up his bed and walk home? Let's see what happens in verse 12. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying we never saw anything like this. What Jesus has just proved as this man got up and walked is that because of who he is, God, he can forgive sin, all sin. That in itself is amazing and wonderful, isn't it? If you want your sins forgiven, if you recognise that you're a sinner, that you've offended God and that your sins have cut you off from him and you face his judgment, if you want to be forgiven, no matter what you have done, you can come to Jesus knowing that he has the authority to forgive you everything. 
Just as importantly though, he has the compassion to forgive you everything. I said earlier that there's a link between this incident at the start of chapter 2 where Jesus forgives the paralytic and the incident immediately before that at the end of chapter 1 where he heals a leper. We see the link in Jesus' compassion and in the fact that leprosy pictures sin for us. Cast your mind back to just a few minutes ago when we thought about the man with leprosy. Leprosy left you cut off, isolated from everyone. People were repulsed by you and it caused you to suffer in so many ways, both physically and emotionally. That's a picture of what sin does to us. Sin leaves us cut off, isolated, but actually in an even more damaging way. It leaves us cut off and isolated from God himself. Uh, sin, you see, is repulsive in his eyes. It is offensive. He cannot look upon it, and rightly so. It ultimately leads to God's righteous judgment on us for our sin. But just as Jesus showed great compassion in reaching out and touching the outcast leper. So he shows compassion in reaching out to touch outcast sinners. You see, those very people who you would expect to repulse Jesus, he actually moves towards. Uh, let me close with a couple of quotes about the heart of Jesus and his compassion for people like you and me who sin, whose sin cuts us off from God and leaves us under judgment. I came across them when I was reading earlier this week, these quotes, and they're so helpful in understanding the way that Jesus feels about people who are cut off from God because of their sin. And that's all of us. The quote goes like this, we naturally think of Jesus touching us the way a little boy reaches out to touch a slug for the first time, face screwed up, cautiously extending an arm, giving a yelp of disgust upon contact and instantly withdrawing. But in actual fact, Christ's holiness does not mean that he finds our non-holiness repulsive. Rather, his kindness, his compassion, his love means that he is drawn towards sinners in order to make them holy like himself, in order to forgive them and cleanse them. When Jesus looked at the paralytic man here in Mark chapter 2, what he saw first of all was not in fact someone who could not walk, but rather someone lost in sin, cut off from God, facing judgment. So in kind compassion, he reached out to forgive that man his sin. He used his authority as God to show the man the greatest loving kindness that there is. Forgiveness of all his sin. And that is what Jesus compassionately offers you and I. That again brings our service to a close. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, once more, if there's anything that particularly has struck you as you've been watching and listening and you'd like to know more about, about the Lord Jesus Christ perhaps, or about our church, please do get in touch. Uh, head across to our website. 
ingletonevangelicalchurch.org where you'll find a contact page and you can get in touch with us via that. You'll find a telephone number there as well that you can call if you want to talk to somebody. Uh, if you're a local particularly and you'd like to get in touch, perhaps you're just lonely and want someone to talk to, uh, do let us know. Do go to the website. Do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you and help you in any way we can. Uh, once this service ends, which will be very soon, uh, please do head over to our playlists. Uh, there you'll find some songs that have been chosen to accompany today's service. Uh, do listen into those. You may want to sing along at home if you would like to. There'll also be some children's songs there as well uh, that if you have younger ones, they may enjoy listening to and singing along to. Okay, it's been lovely to have you with us uh, and trust we'll see you again next week. <laughs>